Heavenly Father, we come before you. 
as a true family of the God who is above all. And Father, let us never forget that by and through Christ Jesus, our Lord and King, we are the true children of the God who is above all. So Father, we ask for your guidance, your leading, you walk in us, that all that we do will be on earth as it is in heaven and no other. We love you, Father God. We pray for your hands to be on our brothers and sisters that are still on the way and those who are able to come. Your blessings be on them that they will know that they are the true children of the God who is above all. We love you, Father. And in the most righteous name of Christ Jesus, we pray. And all God's children say, Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Ladies and gentlemen, why don't you sit for the next few minutes? Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live.
Good morning, New Hope Volcano. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I love that song so much. I can't tell you. I'm, I'm trying to catch my breath right now, but I think that might have been my favorite song from the very first time I ever heard it in this church. And I still love it the same today. I just love that song. It, it means so much to me because we are called to pass on the good news of the gospel message. And so from generation to generation, we, we were to pass this on just as it has been passed on to us. And so I just love, uh, love that. Love that song so much. Well, we have some announcements for you this morning. <laughs> we're going to call our sister Chris up. She has a bunch for you. As she's coming down, I'm going to say that this Wednesday night, no Bible study this Wednesday night. We just finished the book of Ephesians, so we're taking a break this Wednesday. No Bible study, okay? Well, that's what I was hoping you are going to miss it, and then the next Wednesday you're going to be hungry for it. So <laughs> thank you, Chris. God loves you. Is this mic on? Okay. It doesn't sound like it. <laughs> All right, so on Monday, haha, -ha, people will be getting together to pray for you. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, you can put them in the bowl back there so they can pray specifically for you. Uh, Wednesday, no Bible study, but it's usually <laughs> on Wednesdays, uh, dinner at 5 and Bible study at 5.30. So 
Thursday hula at five o'clock right here. Friday yard ninjas at 8 a.m. Rain or shine out there making this place look beautiful. And then celebrate recovery at six o'clock on Friday night. Hallelujah! Important announcement. Celebrate recovery is now offering child care. I know, I know. It's been uh, since the pandemic that we have not had child care, but we now have child care. Um, that being said, if you would like to volunteer or help out with the child care, you're welcome. <laughs> But also come to celebrate recovery and uh, leave your children in the arms of a certified teacher. That would be me. <laughs> um, men's ministry is always on Saturday, the third Saturday at 9 a.m. So that would be October 19th. Yeah, hallelujah. Women's ministry was yesterday. It's always on the last Saturday of the month. So that would be October 26th. <laughs> Only on Zoom at 8 a.m. If you're interested, see Stacy. Um, the Christmas fair is coming. <laughs> That's why I broke out the Christmas attire this morning. Um, December 7th. And I sent out the email yesterday to all of our past vendors. We already have seven confirmed. I know it's so awesome. Um, so if you would like to be a vendor or you know someone like to, who would like to be a vendor, all I need is an email. Um, somebody gave me the idea this morning of sending all of you the email that I send to the vendors and then you could always forward it. Just make sure that they email me so that I can get them on the list and confirm them and send them the information sheet that tells them set up at seven, the fair opens at eight, the fair closes at one o'clock, all those fun things. Um, but yes, we are actively looking for vendors, love to have vendors. Uh, we usually can get about 30 and they fill this lanai, that lanai and the youth room. So it's a really fun time. Hopefully you'll circle it on your calendar and be here December 7th whether you want to vend or shop, 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 shop. Um, we are currently on YouTube Live. And we are also at newhopevolcano.com. You could share our video. You could share our email. You could share um, our website if you wanted to let other people know about this wonderful church. And all glory and honor are his. Mahalo. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, sister. All right. So I think that's it for announcements. We're about to collect the tithes and the offerings. Like Chris said, we have a website, newhopevolcano.com. You can check it out. We got all kinds of things going on up there. It's allow all the information and all the what's going on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, check out the website if you want to. You can also give your tithe or your offering that way. There is a hamburger menu. You can click down. Uh, it says give online. We've been using that process for four going on five years now. It's awesome. I think many of you are already using it. Um, so you can give that way. If you're in the building and you want to give, we have the offering bowl in the back where Uncle Randy's sitting. You can drop your tithe or your offering in there. <clears throat> of course, we always like to say that if you are visiting us for the first time, please hold back on your money. Just be blessed with what the Lord has in store for you this morning. If you're visiting us from another church, we ask that you too as well hold back on your money and take it to your home church. And if you are a part of this wonderful, awesome, amazing church body and you want to give this morning, please, we ask that you just give with a cheerful heart. If we could bow our heads. Yes, Lord, we're so grateful, Father, for all that you do in our lives, Lord for knowing our hearts, for knowing what we need, for providing for us, for caring for us, for always being there for us. We're so grateful that we can turn to you anytime we want to, anytime we need to, and you are there and you hear our prayers. And Father, this morning, as united as one church body, we lift our tithes and our offerings up to you. We pray that you multiply it in abundance. And we pray that we use it according to your will, Lord. We thank you so much for bringing us here today. 
We thank you for the word that will be shared from Pastor Ray this morning. We look forward to it uh, with open minds and open hearts. And we pray that you give us ears to hear this morning, Lord, that we may hear your word and etch it on our hearts so that we can apply it to our lives and we can be more like your son, Christ Jesus. We love you, O oh Lord. We give you all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise this morning. And we pray in Christ Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you can help me welcome the most wonderful, bestest pastor in the whole wide world. <laughs> Finally, Pastor Jason and Happy and Care have given me an opportunity to speak. I've been waiting. Weeks and weeks and weeks to speak. <laughs> you can see, <coughs> you can see by the the screen and on your notes. You should have notes if you want them on, on the green sheets. This is the, the the message this morning is relationship navigation, and it's relationship navigation because it's sort of like. If you have been on a, a any kind of a seagoing vessel, you have to navigate. And sometimes you even think that you know how to navigate, but they still put the harbor pilot on. And they put the harbor pilot on because going through that specific channel to get to a specific harbor requires special attention. Just like our relationships, they uh, require special attention. Please say with me, special attention. Ready to go? Special attention. Everybody probably has at least one experience when a relationship that you've been involved in could be husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, father, son, uh, mother, daughter, uh, uh, parent, grandparent. Everybody has at least one, probably more, experiences when your relationship has not gone very well. And if it's not gone very well, if yours was like mine, it's painful. <coughs> It's really painful because it almost seems like a fruitless endeavor to try to patch up whatever has occurred. And you're trying to figure out all the best way how you can do that, how you can patch up your relationship. And you come up with some ideas and they're not very good because they don't yield any positive results. And as a believer, as somebody who takes instruction from the Bible, your method of operation is going to be much different from everybody in the world. Because everybody in the world, if a relationship starts to break down and you want to retaliate in the world, that's okay. You can retaliate if you want. If you want to ignore them for the rest of your life in the world, you can do that. You can. If you want to do all of these different things, if you want to strike back, if you want to get even, that's acceptable behavior in the world. But we're not operating by the world standard, right? We're operating by the Bible standard. We're operating by the word of God, the word that he's breathed and given to us. It's, it, the Bible says that all scripture, you know this verse, all scripture is what? inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord. And so it would behoove us to look to the word to see what could be done. What are the things that we can do in order that we might address some of these fractures that occur in our relationships? What can we do to try to have that, whether we call it this or not, what can we do to have a biblically sound, even people in the world, you don't have to believe in the Bible, but the advice that the Bible gives you is biblically sound and it behooves you because it'll yield positive results. So our relationship was that was sort of twisted, just kind of bent, can be put back straight. Maybe yours is not is past bent, now it's got a little fracture. Like you can't even see it, but if you look on an x-ray, you can see a little fracture. Maybe that describes your relationship. Or maybe it's gone too far, so it is actually a break in a relationship. And maybe, maybe here in person or maybe online, maybe your relationship is totally broken. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far you are away in this relationship. 
so totally broken, you don't even think you have any hope of fixing that relationship, that there will be no way that that could ever be healed. So let's look at certain things. Now, the question we might ask and be very logical is, do we need relationships? I refer you to the first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. And the Lord God said, now he's going to speak to us. It is not good for man to be alone. Amen. <coughs> I will make a companion for him, a helper suited to his needs. That's from the Living Bible. If you're looking at King James, you're looking at New International Version, any different versions, you may have a little bit different, but you get the picture. God has said it's not good for us to be alone. In this context, he's speaking specifically about a mate because so far there's only Adam and God says, not good for you to be alone. Now, why do we need relationships? Because I propose to you that the answer to do we need relationships, the answer to that question is, yeah, you bet, we need relationships. The next question is why? In your most quizzical voice, would you ask me why? Why? I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to give you a couple of reasons. <laughs> the first one is to prevent isolation. You can fill that in. To prevent isolation. And I refer you back again to that verse that we just looked at. We just saw that, that, that God says it's not good for a man to be alone. I'm going to give you a help me. Somebody suited to your knees. Prevent isolation. Sometimes... There is a tendency. I did this for many, many years. I still do this sometimes in, the, in this modern day. There is a tendency that when there is a fracture in your relationship, you tend to isolate. You don't want to be near anybody, not even just that person. You don't want to be near anybody. You don't want to be near your friends. You don't want to be near your coworkers. You just rather isolate. You, you rather withdraw. And I'm going to tell you right now this morning, withdrawal is not good. Please say with me, it's not good. Ready, go. It's not, not good. good. Withdrawal is not good. I want to go on record this morning saying that I am, I am, Pastor Ray Glory, the holiest guy when I first get up in the morning. Because I'm not next to anybody. I'm not even next to Lonnie. It's just me. Oh, I can hold up every biblical standard that there is. My speech is just holy. My behavior is righteous. My thinking is all, all Bible-based. But as soon as I get next to some people, then things start to go different. In most cases, it can go well. The point I'm trying to make to you is if you in isolation, it's easy to have righteous behavior. But be next to people. Try to cultivate relationships. Try to build your relationships. And not even outside your house. Inside your house with people that live in your house. Try to cultivate that relationship. And now you know that's where the rubber meets the road. Because now it gets hard. Not always easy to maintain those kinds of relationships. The truth is spiritual truth. And you can, you can fill this in. Spiritual growth. It may, and many times it does, it begins in isolation. But the fact is it never matures. So you want to isolate, okay, cool. That's going to begin. But it, it's never going to mature. Your, your, your behavior, your relationships will never mature if you stay in isolation. The spiritual maturity that we see, I think I can say this, uh, and, and it's truthful, the spiritual maturity that we seek is found on the highway of relationships. You want to be mature, you got to get on the highway. If you don't get on the highway of relationships, I don't think your, your uh, maturity will blossom and bloom and progress. Believer needs to have uh, interaction, relationships with other people. So this is the first reason. you got to prevent isolation. Here's the second one. We need a helper. We need a helper. And again, I refer you to the Genesis uh, verse we just looked at. God is saying to Adam, bro, you need a helper. Okay, now why does he need a helper? Why does he need a helper living over there with him? It's not to cook 
because they're not cooking anything. They're just picking stuff off the trees. So he don't need a helper to cook. He don't need a helper to wash clothes and, and clean clothes. They're no more clothes. They're not wearing any clothes in the Garden of Eden. So it's not, it's not that. He needs a helper, and God knows this. He needs a helper so that he can serve God properly, so he can serve God to his fullest capability. And he's not going to be able to do that by himself. He needs a helper to be with him. Now, every one of us has tried our very, very best to do something just right, just as perfect as we could get it. And in spite of our best efforts, we still have failed. People still don't like us. People still talk stink about us. People still isolate themselves. They leave the room when we come. We don't understand that. We think we did, the, we did everything we could. There's a phrase, you know, I bent over backwards to try to appease uh, them. I, I bent over backwards to try to uh, uh, meet their needs or whatever it might have been. Still, we fail. They totally misinterpret, misunderstand what we have tried to do. And to that end, I think that the Bible gives some very clear uh, guidelines, and we've called them in the notes rules for great relationships, because I don't think anybody got up this morning and said, oh, I don't like great relationships. What I want is lousy relationships. That's my goal is to have lousy relationships, to drag myself all distraught and you know, I'll have my life full of animosity. Every time I go in a room, everybody leaves. Ah, that's my goal. Nobody in their right mind says that. Everybody wants great relationships. What's the Bible say? Here are some, uh, here are some suggestions that they give. And many of them came from or have come from Revelation in chapter 2, the book of Revelation, chapter 2. And if it sounds familiar, this is the last Sunday of the month. On the very first Sunday of the month, Pastor Jason spoke on Revelation chapter 2. So if it sounds familiar, it's because he just brought it up. What do you want to do if you want a great relationship? Number one, confront with care. Okay, so you got to confront. I wish I could tell you that you don't need to do anything. Just wait for the, you know, wait for it to blow over, but it doesn't. Confront with care. Revelation chapter 2. We see Christ, and Christ is confronting the church. It's the same verse that Pastor Jason used, but it's broken up into several different, very definitive steps. If you look at that, you notice what has occurred. Sometimes Christians, instead of going to the person that they got problems with, they do all kind of unbiblical things. And I'm not pointing at you when I say that. I'm pointing at me. I've done plenty of unbiblical things when I'm trying to fix a relationship, and I don't want to do it, and I guess that you don't want to do it either. So we, don't want, we want to take instructions as God would give us from his word. Please, please notice, here's what Christ did. So he's dealing with this church in Ephesus. We begin the verse, I read to you. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, all good news so far, and that you cannot endure evil men. He's talking really nicely to them. Now it continues. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles. That's a good thing. And they are not. And you found them to be false. He goes on. And you have perseverance. That's terrific. And have endured for my name's sake and have grown and have not grown weary. Now you break that passage down into several small bite-sized pieces. You can see when Jesus is confronting, and in this case he's confronting the church, he does several different things. One is he focuses on the good. You should write that down because that's where the conversation should start. Sometimes, I mean, we halfway joking and halfway serious say these things, but you know, when you sometimes confront people, instead of focusing on the good, so the, you know, local action is what? What? <laughs> you know, if you don't know, I want to tell you, that's not focusing on the good. You cannot start the conversation by saying, what? Don't, you can't say that. And that's not the example that Jesus gives. He gives an example. 
So what he does is he focuses on the good. He's saying, I see the deeds. I know the toils. I see the perseverance that you have you, you have displayed. I know that you cannot endure evil men. All that stuff that we said in that verse. And then he moves on. He acknowledges their loyalty. Now, this is really important because there's probably nothing more hurtful than if you uh, question or put into question somebody's loyalty. Many, I'm sorry to say, marriages that I have uh, tried to help people, this was the pivotal point. They, they question each other's loyalty. Man, the relationship is doomed because that got to change. You question loyalty, it's a big deal. And so Jesus speaks about that. He acknowledges their loyalty. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to focus on the good, acknowledge the loyalty. And then you get into the place where you hear number three, you state the problem. Eventually, you got to say, what's wrong? How did we get here? You have to identify it, hopefully in some very specific terms. You see this happening in verses 4 and 5. But I have this against you. That's the same place where Pastor Jason was speaking about the first Sunday of the month, that you have left your first love. He stated the problem. And then this is terribly important. Number four, you have to offer the solution. You have to state the problem, offer the solution. I read to you the verse now. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. He says, you've left your first love, but here's what you got to do. You got to remember, therefore, where you came from. Try look from where you were and look how you're acting now. You're supposed to be that. He says, remember and look from where you came. Look how far you have fallen. This is, a, this is the solution. And how, what, what are you going to do now that you're looking? You're going to repent. The Bible says if you confess your sins, he is faithful to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You have to repent of your sins. Jesus tells them what they can do to get this fractured relationship, this the church of Ephesus, back on track. That's what Jesus modeled. So confront with care. And then you got to uh, watch God. Now you're observing what he's doing. Reveal your weaknesses. Please fill it in that way through others. So he, watch and see how he's going to reveal your own weaknesses through other people. I give you this example. You can look at it later on. Genesis, new ch uh, first chapter of the Bible. Um, chapter 29. Please say with me, Genesis 29. Ready to go? Genesis, Genesis 29. 29. You go to that story. Many of you already know, but if you need a refresher, go back. Genesis 29. Here you see Jacob, and Jacob is deceiving his brother. Got a very interesting name, Esau. Okay, so Jacob, he's deceiving his brother Esau, and he not only did that, he deceived his father too. So Jacob is a deceiver. You see that very quickly as Genesis 29 unfolds. When you go through that, you see Jacob, and I'll show you the verse 25 in just a few moments. He goes as quickly as he can, and he finds himself as at Uncle Laban's house. Please say with me, Uncle Laban. Ready to go? Uncle Laban. So Jacob is over there. He looks in the side and says, oh, look at this, Rachel. Hoo -hoo, what a babe. So beautiful. I, I would like to marry her. So he goes to to, to Rachel's dad, he said, I want to marry your daughter. And, and Rachel's dad said, that's great. Wonderful. Here's what you do. You work seven years. After you finish working seven years, you can marry my daughter. And you remember how the story unfolds. He actually does work for seven years. Comes time for him to be married. And oh, was that Rachel? <laughs> was Leah. Rachel was the beautiful one. Leah was the plain one. He got married to Leah. He got tricked by Rachel's dad. Here is verse 25. In essence, so Jacob is seeing these qualities. You're a schemer. You're a deceiver. You're a liar. 
he sees it as if he's looking in a mirror. Jacob is here. He's looking at Rachel's dad. He is seeing the same kind of despicable qualities that he has himself. Verse 25, when morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? The very guy who deceived his brother, he deceived his father. Now he asks me, how come you deceived me? He's being deceived himself. And many, many times when we get into relationship fractures and breaks, part of the reason that that's occurring, part of the lesson we're supposed to learn is that that, that person is revealing qualities that we ourselves possess. And so as much as we don't care for them when we look at that, we are uh, being called to self-evaluate. So that's me. I should do something about this scheming, lying, deceiving. This is really one of God's tools. That's why you get a broken, fractured relationship. It's not all doom and gloom because God is using everything including that broken relationship to reach out to you and to make you into something more mature, better. And as I said earlier, it works with everything. Mother, daughter, broken relationship can work with that. Father, son can work with that. Spouse can work with that. Boyfriend, girlfriend can work with that. It can be applied all across the board. Then here's another thing. Don't compare yourself. This is number three with others. Comparing yourself with others, bad news. Look at what the apostle says. I refer you to 2 Corinthians of the New Testament, chapter 10, and I read to you in verse 12. Of course, we would not dare classify ourselves or compare ourselves with those who rate themselves highly. And look what it says. This is today's English version. So this is straight out of the Bible. How stupid they are. Now, I don't know how you feel about that word. When I was growing up in my home, stupid was a bad word. We cannot say that without getting licking at my house. Um, shut up is a bad word at my house. You say that at my house, you're getting licking. And so the fact that, for at least for me, the fact that they choose to use in this translation how stupid they are is quite... Uh, telling to me. The fact of the matter is we are all made differently. We all have different personalities. We all have different temperaments. We all have different talents, every single one of us. And you would be wise to thank God for who you are and for the place that he's placed you and given you in the kingdom of God. You would be wise to thank him rather than compare yourself with somebody else. Well, how come, how come I don't hear like Pastor Jason? God, have I not served you well? I pull ahead and this this only that's God given. Why compare yourself? You know, we are saying the Bible is saying, don't compare, don't do that. Now, add to that number four, which is quite important, and it it is this. This is the suggestion. Destroy bitterness. If you have, I pray that it's not true at this particular moment. But if it, even if it is true, uh, I pray that you can destroy it. If it's not true, you're going to you're going to have the opportunity, or things may occur. Maybe you are tempted to become bitter. I pray that you would be able to address it in a biblical way. Bitterness, if you got any bitterness in your life or if you get any bitterness in your life, here's what I suggest. You can make a mental picture. You take your bitterness, take dynamite, wrap them all up, throw them outside, destroy it, blow it up, get rid of it. The sooner, the better. Because if you don't, now this is not joking, you don't get rid of bitterness, it will kill you. You're going to get killed. So that's why I said you got to attack it and you got to attack it aggressively. Now, please uh, note that there is a difference between anger and bitterness. I'm not talking about anger. I'm speaking about bitterness. This is aimed at bitterness. 
Anger comes and it goes. Sometimes you can see that very easily. One moment you're angry, and in the next minute, two minutes, three minutes, you're not angry anymore. That comes and goes. But bitterness, it doesn't go. One week goes by, you're still bitter. One month, you're still bitter. One year, one decade go by in certain situations, you're still bitter. And it comes out. It doesn't take very long. You get in this relationship with with whoever you had with all fractured, broken relationship, you got bitterness. It comes out. And it not just comes out with them. It comes out with everybody around you. They start to suffer because of your bitterness. Now, what are you going to do about it? I can give you some ways. One is, we spoke about this just a few moments ago. You've got to confess it to Christ. Now, I gave you scripture verses all along the way. First John this is chapter one. I read to you. You got to read it yourself later. If we confess our sins, I just said this a few moments ago. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us for all, from all unrighteousness. That's the first thing you got to do. And then you got to ask God for help. Number two, ask him. It's unfortunate that in many instances, we could avail ourselves of a lot of help from the Lord, but we don't ask. The Bible says you don't get because you don't ask. Sometimes you ask, but you ask with wrong motives. you got to ask. He wants you to participate in the whole process. Matthew chapter 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Knock and the door will be open to you. So you got to ask for help. And then here's number three. Forgive everyone who has offended you. Now, I'm not just throwing this out because I'm all that. I'm throwing this out because that's what the Bible says. Is it easy? No. Please say it with me. No. Ready to go. No. It's not easy. Sometimes we can do it lots of times, especially with very deep-seated broken relationships, very deep-seated problems, deep problems. It's very difficult to forgive people who have offended us. Nevertheless, that's what Christ asks of us. You can remind yourself that the Apostle Paul writes about this specific topic, Ephesians chapter 4. Get rid, he says, of all bitterness, rage, anger. Get rid of it. Blow it up. Be kind and compassionate to one another. He says, forgive one another. Then ask God to heal you. Ask him to heal you. God heals. We sing this this psalm, Psalm 147. We see we sing it sometimes here um, during the worship session. Oh, he heals the brokenhearted, binding up their wounds. It is good to bless his holy name. That's what he's going to do. Ask him to heal you. And then here's number five. Deal quickly with your anger. Don't let it sit and simmer and boil. Don't do that. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Where do we see that? In the Bible. He's saying, uh, the Bible is saying to us, take care of those issues as quickly as you can. Confront with care. Acknowledge loyalty. Let God reveal your weaknesses. Don't compare. Destroy bitterness. Now you can turn your notes over. Repay your offenders with kindness. And again, I will acknowledge to you, it is not easy sometimes. And in fact, sometimes it seems almost impossible to do that. Fortunately for us, the Bible says all things are possible with God. There is nothing impossible with God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, see that no one repays another evil for evil. It continues, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. Now you needed more. Follow that with 1 Peter. This is the third chapter. I read to you from verse 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. It said, don't do that, but with blessing. Because to this you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. You're doing it so that you can be blessed, so that you can mature. You can do all of these things. Don't repay or repay 
your offenders with kindness. And then here's another one. Share the joy of another's success. You notice I save all the hard ones for the end. I'm giving you all the hard ones now. Share the joy of another's success. I refer to you, um, Pastor Jason's favorite, favorite book in the Bible. Which, which book is that? Romans. Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And it says, says in verse 15, mourn with those who mourn. Sometimes we may be pretty good at mourning with those who mourn, but maybe we're not too good at rejoicing with those who are rejoicing. But make no mistake about it. It is a biblical mandate. Please say with me. It's a mandate. Ready to go. It's a mandate. That means you don't get to. You're going to follow Christ. You don't get to choose whether you want to or you don't want to. It's a mandate. We're required to do it. And we're required to do it because this is the thing that builds up our inner man, our inner woman. It builds up our spirit. That's why he's uh, saying that this is so important. And risk saying, this is number seven, risk saying, you are valuable and I care about you. Risk saying, now again, you make a mental picture. You just had, you're trying to repair this bus up relationship. And you can, de you can determine what degree. Small, big, medium, totally broken. You're trying to do that. The recommendation is for you to articulate. You are valuable. You are valuable. I care about you. Now, sometimes it sounds easy when you just put it there like on a piece of paper and you read it. Uh, not that easy to do sometimes. Just like, you know, I, I, I wrote, I've said to you many different ways. I've wrote blogs about it. Sometimes what is necessary is for somebody to say, I love you. But do you think we say that? Nope. Do we say it automatically, I love you? Nope. It's hard for us to say it sometimes because we're just in the throes of this tumultuous turmoil, fireworks, everything. I mean, we got real problems. We don't even know if we want to be in the same house together, in the same car together, in the same church together, in the same classroom together. We don't know that because our relationship is so fractured. Risk saying you're valuable to me. That's why I want to make this. That's why I want to work on this relationship. I care about you. That's why I want to work on that. You're valuable to me. Sometimes I ask myself, <laughs> why don't people, including me, why don't I do that and do it more regularly? And I don't know about you. You can make your own answer. Why don't you do that more uh, regularly? I just answer for myself. The reason I don't do it regularly or more regularly, the reason it doesn't come to the first thing that I think of is because I don't like being vulnerable. If I say to you, I love you, there is an anticipation, maybe an expectancy. I tell you happy, I love you. How come he don't tell me he loved me too? I have an expectation. Why doesn't he reciprocate? That's why. In order for that not to occur, I'm not going to say it. Then I'm not let down and, and all of that. This is a scheme by the devil to make you all confused and make it more complicated than it is. The bottom line is you want to be obedient to Christ. He said, given the directions already, tell them you love them. Okay, you got to do it. Never mind about your vulnerability and uh, fear of, of being rejected. You got to cast that aside in order that you can say, I was obedient to the Lord. Never mind that you fear, oh, what, what if I'm wrong? What if, what, what if my, all my faults are pointed out to me? What if I feel like I'm less of a man than I really think that I am when they start to speak back to me? If this expression, expressing appreciation for people has an adverse effect, 
that they don't reciprocate in a proportionate way. Like I gave them a whole big box of Big Island uh, shortbread cookies, but they give me one small cookie. I'm disappointed. I only make jest of that is because that really is is what it comes down to, at least for me. I fear that there will not be reciprocation in a proportionate way. That's one of the big things, that I'll be wrong, that things will go haywire. I'm going to close with a couple of poignant passages, and then we can end this morning. The first one comes from Philippians, one of my favorite books, chapter 1, one of my favorite chapters. I start reading to you from verse number 7. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. For whether, whether I am in chains, he says, or whether I'm defending or confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify. Listen to what he says. God can testify of how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. This is a man who cared about people in every single situation. He's a great model template for us. Add to that in 2 Timothy now chapter 1. I begin reading to you from verse number 3. I thank God. This is always a good place to start. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly. Imagine you told that to somebody. Hey, night and day, I'm constantly praying for you. Night and day, I always have you before, before the Lord. It's my pleasure to lift your name before the Lord. Night and day, constantly. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. You got something against somebody else. Relationship broken. God has given us some very specific instructions to follow the only question is are you going to follow them i pray that you will answer in a very big definitive yes i will as best as i can yes i will heavenly father we thank you for allowing us to gather this morning we thank you lord for addressing this very important uh um topic for us, um, relationships, because it's applicable right now, Lord, in the, our day-to-day -day lives. I pray, Lord, especially not just for our congregation in general, here in person and online. I pray for those who are in a relationship uh, fracture right at this time, when they are needing, Lord, to walk through. They're needing help in navigating through in order that they can come to a successful outcome. I pray in Jesus' name over them. I pray some of the things that we spoke about this morning would be readily applicable to them and that they would be able to implore, uh, employ all of these um, um, instructions that you have given to us in order that uh, not only the relationship would be healed, but that they would be able to serve you in a more meaningful way, that their lives would more closely resemble the life that you have designed them to have. We thank you in advance, Lord, uh, for what you're going to do in those situations. Congregation, before I get ready to close, I just want to make sure that anybody here in person or online, you've, haven't, you've had an opportunity to receive Christ. If you have not, I'm going to say a prayer in the next few moments. When I say the prayer, it is you asking for salvation from the Lord. I can help you because I can formulate the words to this prayer. I'll do it in just the next few moments. But you, if you want to say you want salvation, something that you heard, anything that's maybe one thing that you heard uh, prompts you to open your heart to the Lord. Maybe you never did that before. The fact of the matter is there comes a time when you have to step over the line. The Bible is very clear to us. It says, for all have sinned. This is in Romans as well. 
For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. We all need a Savior. The Bible says, but the free gift of God is salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible further says, there is no other name on heaven and earth by which a man or a woman can be saved, only the name of Jesus. So you got to step over the line. Um, unfortunate thing is sometimes, depending on how we grew up, our family dynamic, everything like that, uh, sometimes we think, uh, well, you know, uh, my grandparents were Christians, so I must be one Christian too. Or my parents were Christians, or my, my children are Christians, so I must be a Christian too. The fact of the matter is you got to make up your own, uh, you got to make your own decision. you got to step all across the line yourself. Nobody can do it for you. Your kids can't do it for you. You can't do it for them. Everybody's got to do that for themselves. If you, that's what you want to do, I'll say the prayer. You follow me, just repeat after me. And as I said, I provide you the words, but you got to provide the personality, the voice, and the sincerity, the genuineness. That all comes from you. Okay, so I'll pray. You pray in an audible voice because there's something happens when you can hear yourself speaking. Everybody do that here in the room and online. I might ask all others, because there are plenty of, other, plenty of people in here have already received salvation, but I ask you to say the prayer as well so that we might accompany any of those that might be saying it for the very first time. They don't have to say it by themselves. We'll, we'll all say it together. Okay? So everybody out, uh, out in the lanai, everybody in the room, please repeat after me in an audible voice. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I thank you for Jesus. You for Jesus. Dear, Jesus, Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I've done lots of things lots of on things. my own. Oh my I have not always oh asked for your help Absolutely. or your advice. Your advice. I want to change that now. Change that this now. morning, I recognize you as my forgiver and as my leader. Come into my life. And as best as I know how, and as long as I know how, I will follow you. So now I say, so I can hear me, you can hear me, my neighbor can hear me, and the devil can hear me. Jesus Christ is my Lord. I will follow him and him alone. Thank you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus, for loving me first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us stewardship of that gospel message. We realize, Lord, that you could spread the gospel so many ways more effectively. But the fact that you choose to use us to spread the gospel is uh, something that you can explain to us when we see you in eternity in heaven. Um, we're going to do the best that we can, Lord. We pray your blessing over any of those that might have made new commitments this morning. Let them know, Lord, that you love them. Embrace them with your arms of love the way that only you can. Let them know, Lord, that the trajectory of their eternity just changed in the last few moments because previously they were headed for an eternity totally separated from you. But with that confession of faith, that acceptance of salvation, they are assured guaranteed a place with you in heaven for all time. Mahalo ke akua. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us as we head out of this place. Allow us to be your ambassadors as we um, share the gospel in the communities, workplaces, recreation places where you have placed us. We pray this morning in Jesus Christ's strong name. Ladies and gentlemen, help me close by saying amen and amen. 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 Sunday morning service. We are happy that you came to spend this morning with us. We're going to sing one more song, and uh, if you feel like singing, we're going to do Leading on the Everlasting Arms. Because I like when, when uh, Sister Carolyn uh, uh, plays uh, my lid. If you feel like singing, you can stay in the room and you can sing with us. If you're ready for your refreshments, refreshment table already. Uh, set up. You can make your way out there to the door on my left. If you're going to head out, be careful because it's raining, especially when you get to Highway 11. 
Watch the cars going up and down so quickly. Whatever you decide to do, God bless you and have a great week. <laughs>